coming today. Uh, Dr. Christy Duran is going to talk about some of the new uses for fungi and biotechnology. Uh, thank you all for coming. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about my interest with this. Uh, when I first came to Adams State, um, I came as a, a plant a biologist. And I always call myself sort of a backdoor botanist because I really um, studied evolutionary biology and got into uh, evolutionary biology with plants and then really interested in plants and kind of learned my way that way, the postdoc and, and so forth. So when I came here, um, mycology was one of the classes that um, I had to teach. And I always thought it was interesting, but really it was a huge learning curve. So I learned a lot about, um, about mycology. And one of the things that I learned is there's so many ways in which we use fungi um, and that, that I had never really thought of. Uh, for example, my mom is a diabetic. She's been a diabetic for 54 years. And I've, so all growing up, I remember her having to take insulin and some of the reactions that she had when her blood sugars were really low, she had too much um, um, insulin. And she had really violent reactions. And, and the insulin that she used to use was extracted from uh, pigs. And so it was pig insulin. Um, and then, seeing her, she's gone through different uh, forms of insulin. Uh, they were able finally to get humulin, uh, human insulin. And they did that by taking the gene of human insulin and put it into E. coli, and then having E. coli uh, produce um, insulin. And then there's a lot of a, a purifying process. There's uh, some companies now that use fungi to do this. And it's uh, easier to do this because um, whereas the E. coli keep the insulin inside of the uh, cell bodies, they have to break that up to get at the insulin and then clar clarify all of that. The fungi will secrete the insulin directly into the solution. So then you can take that out and you can reuse those, um, those organisms and not having to, to kill them and, and recolonize them all of the time. So that was one, just one of the things that I, I learned about what you can use fungi for. So I wanted to delve more into what, what do we use it for, what maybe is the future of fungi and, and biotechnology. But I want to start by kind of going through what we used to, what, historic uses of fungi. So I'm going to go through talking a little bit about the past, how we've used fungi, and then we'll talk about kind of what, what we are currently using them, uh, and of course things will bleed over. Some of the things that we've always used fungi for, we still use it. And then also there'll be a little bit going into the future where a lot of research is being done, starting to be used today, and will probably be used much more um, in the future. Okay. So let's first talk about some um, historical uses. And so dating way back uh, to the Aztecs uh, and, and, and other cultures, uh, cultures have used, or people have used um, mushrooms for uh, visions because some of the chemicals in some fungi have uh, hallucigen, hallucinogenic properties. And so one of them is um, um, this particular mushroom here in which the chemical from that uh, is a serotonin agonist, and it, um, so basically it mimics serotonin in the brain. It acts through a different pathway and then causes um, these um, hallucinations. Yeah. Mushrooms have been used as medicine for um, a long time, uh, particularly in Asian cultures. And so some of the things which they've been used for is, is that as an antioxidant, an anti-inflammatory. Um, some uh, people claim that they are uh, cancer treatment because they can cause um, apoptosis or programmed cell death in um, these rapidly dividing cells. Uh, they also have um, various vitamins and minerals um, that help boost the immune system. And also, um, some uh, fungi have had said to be um, hepatoprotectant, meaning uh, helping the liver out. And then, of course, lots of um, food and drink has been um, uh, associated with fungi and uh, fungal uh, mechanisms. So just how many can we name? So what's on your pizza? Right. Right, mushrooms? What else? Oh yeah, kombucha. So it is. Yeah. Bread. Bread. 
Portobello. What's that? Portobello. Portobello. <laughs> yeah, all, all the different types of mushrooms. Anything else? Beer. Beer. Thank you. I was waiting for someone to say beer. Um, but we'll start with cheese rather than beer. All right, so cheese is one of them that um, all of the different flavors that you can get with cheese is ascribed to a different fungi. And so the, um, the fungi are important in the ripening of the cheese or basically the maturing of the cheese. And so uh, probably first discovered by just wild yeasts are in the air or fungi in the air, spores that get into um, the cheese as it's settling and then that gives it the different flavors. And so um, this kind of idea of the different flavors really took off, of course, in uh, Europe. And so there's lots of different um, experimenting with different types of fungi to get the different flavors. Um, you might have heard, and, and bacteria can do this as well. I don't know if, if you heard about the thing people are doing to try to get the cheese to smell like your body. So they've done so taking, taking some of the uh, microbes from your body and then using them to ripen cheese. So you could get cheese that tastes like you. <laughs> um, and then, of course, um, bread, right? So we talked about um, bread, and, and this is something in a ancient cultures. Um, bread was often a measurement, loaf of bread. bread. It was also a um, currency. Right? So basically, trading bread and trading beer, these are both uh, products of um, yeast fermentation. And as you know, with um, the yeast, the baker's yeast, that they will ferment the sugars and then causing um, carbon dioxide to be released, which will cause the, the bread to rise. And then um, ethanol gets burned off. And so that's what that delicious smell of, of bread that you're actually smelling is the ethanol being, being burned off. Right. So here's a, this is a picture of a, a Nephrodite and showing the uh, kind of the currency, so the, the bread products um, here. Right. Um, and then here's just going way back, so there's some old um, images. Here's somebody baking bread or mixing the, the batter to make bread. And here's this person uh, watching the loaves uh, expand. And then just the... Uh, um, collecting of the grains for the, for the bread. Right. Um, and then beer. So beer has been around for a very long time, um, probably about 5000 BC is when they think that, that it's been used. Um, they believe that the first fermented drink was probably not beer, uh, but in China, um, about 7000 uh, BC, will be the first uh, consumed fermented uh, drinks. There's lots of different reiterations of kind of the ancient beer. Some of the um, early ones were more like a porridge-like, so kind of this thick um, fermented drink. Um, and that's what you can see here. So, so if they were thick and there was a lot of this um, stuff settling out, all the beer was drunk through the straw. And that's because um, all of the, if it was kind of poured this way, all of the gunky stuff, you swallow that rather the gunky stuff stays at the bottom and, and you get the, the more pure stuff, right? And then here's another image from a pottery of a couple of people probably drinking beer through big, big vats and straws. Okay. Um, so wine, another um, harnessing of the fermentation uh, activity is uh, through uh, fermenting grapes to make wine. And so the first winery, if you remember, uh, it was dated back to um, 4100 BC, and that was um, in Armenia, where they found um, these, the archaeological site found vats. Uh, they found a lot of different um, grape seeds, and so a lot of evidence for probably the very first um, winery. So that was uh, 4,000 years BC. Um, soy sauce, so for those of you who like um, Asian food or like sushi, you know you're going to use a lot of soy sauce. And so um, soy sauce is from the fermentation of soy. And so here is the soy with the, the fungus on it. Um, and then here's your soy sauce. And so it's made in these large vats where they're kind of mixed. And you see they've been doing it for, the, for a very, very long time. 
almost looks like it's the same guy, but probably <laughs> not. <laughs> um, and then this delicacy. Has anyone ever had this? This is corn smut. Um, and it is a delicacy in Mexico, and it is pronounced, I always forget how to pronounce it, uh, wheat coloche. I think that's correct. And it's also known as a Mexican truffle, because it's really very highly prized. I don't know about you, but it doesn't really look very appetizing uh, to me. Um, so here's another image of this. So this is just this um, corn smut, and then it's um, cooked up in tacos and supposed to be pretty good. Okay. Um, fungi has also been used in uh, fabrics, so the um, fermentation vat uh, for dyeing has been around for a um, really, very long time. So fermenting the um, different plant materials to really very get, get the very rich colors um, in the dye. And also using mushrooms themselves um, to produce the different colors. Another way which they've been used, and I'll talk about it, kind of how we're still using it, is basically to um, kind of smooth out woven materials. And so one of the things that fungi is really good at is uh, breaking down plant materials, so breaking down the cell walls. So they have um, cellulase, which is an enzyme that breaks down the cell walls. And so what that does when you have these woven products, um, it helps kind of smooth it out. It breaks apart all of those extra little things um, around there. And that's, they've been using that for a really long time. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how we use fungi today. And I chose this picture because it's how we've been doing it for millennia, right? Drinking um, beer and, and wine. But as you've probably seen in just the last decade, the boom of microbreweries pretty much everywhere. And you often go to restaurants or breweries where you can see those um, fermentation vats um, right there. There's very different strains of yeast. A lot of people really um, guard their particular strain of yeast uh, because um, it's supposed to give them kind of the best drink that's been passed around for generations. And so um, yeast is, is really important. You get you know, lots of different types of beers um, and also um, wine. Okay. And so um, in, this is kind of past, but sort of kind of today in, in general, is the discovery of, of, of penicillin, right? And so um, this is, of course, you all, all should know who discovered penicillin. So who is this guy? Fleming, right, Alexander Fleming. Um, and so the story that I've heard, and I've, I like to tell the story because I think it's fun, and I, it's probably not true, is that he discovered it <laughs> really very accidentally. He was a, um, uh, he worked with bacteria, and that he was also really pretty messy and had to basically his bacterial plates in his office. Over one, and one time he came over, came back over the weekend and found this mold growing in his plates and uh, was about to toss it when he saw that um, there was, where there was the mold growing, there wasn't any bacteria. And so it was basically an, an, an accidental uh, discovery of penicillin. And so it's from uh, the mold, mold uh, penicillium is the genus. And it produces a, a chemical that disrupts the cell wall. It basically inhibits um, the uh, formation of the uh, peptidoglycan, which is in the cell wall that gives us its rigidity. And so when bacteria can't do that, they're going to lice first and, and die. Right. Has anyone ever eaten corn? Not corn, but corn. <laughs> yeah. And so um, this is a, uh, it's called a mycoprotein. And it's made from um, a fungus, Fusarium is the genus. And it's a filamental, filamentous fungus that can be grown um, pretty abundantly in, in, um, and commercially. And it can uh, take on lots of different tastes and basically kind of a, a texture thing. And so you can get kind of chicken, <laughs> chicken cutlets. Uh, you can get vegan burgers. Or you can get basically a mimic of a, of a ground beef, right? So this sort of immense that you can put um, in your, your chili, and it really does just seem like it's um, ground beef. But all of these different things here, it's basically 
the same uh, type of fungus. And, and I've tried it before, and it tastes fine, but afterwards I, I don't feel really well, and I think it's totally psychological when I start thinking, <laughs> I, just, I just ate a fungus burger. Yeah. <laughs> so. But what's interesting about this is that um, you know, uh, for people who are on a non-meat diet, this is a good source of, of protein, but also people are becoming concerned with um, the amount of land available to sustain um, the population. And so there's only about, I think the number was 7.5% of um, a farmable or agricultural land. Um, and that really doesn't leave a lot for kind of for parsing out per individual. Particularly if people are on a meat diet because you require more um, land to sustain that. And so, one of the ideas is that uh, maybe switching over to a different form of a protein that isn't going to require a lot of land um, to grow. And so this would be um, it's called a mycoprotein. This might be a particular option. So we all might be eating corn in the future. Okay. Um, another thing is citric acid. You've probably, probably any product that you pick up and you look at the label, it'll have citric acid um, in it. And so citric acid, this is really very common in um, a lot of your fruits, your uh, lemons, limes, and oranges. And citric acid used to be extracted um, from those for particular um, functions. And so these are some of the things that we use citric acid for. So in beverages, it's a really um, good preservative and it adds flavor. Um, it is kind of one of the stronger acids that's um, edible. And so it's often used to balance out kind of um, any things that you would add that are pretty basic to make it a little bit more neutral by adding the, the acid. Um, it's also used in uh, dis detergents um, and soaps. It's a pretty good uh, chelator. It's also used to, uh, to kind of remove like lime deposits and, and such. A lot of foods, because um, it's, it's a good um, uh, preservative, and so you see it in a lot of different foods. Uh, as well as cosmetics and pharmaceuticals. And again, that's for kind of to balance out um, to the pH, so using citric acid. And then um, other um, industri industrial uses. And so um, citric acid was, like I said before, probably even in the early 1900s, still extracted from um, these citrus fruits. Well, in, I think it was 1926, um, someone discovered that um, fungi can um, basically break down the sugar, ferment the sugar, and produce citric acid. And so it was, uh, became the way to actually make it um, very com uh, commercially and large amounts of it. Um, so here's an uh, example. So here's um, Aspergillus niger, this black mold. And this is sort of a, a kind of an overview of how it's, it's produced. So you have um, this reactor tank where you would have the Aspergillus. You'd have this aeration system kind of putting in the medium. And then the effluent would be the citric acid that's being produced here. So I talked uh, before about how some of those, um, an ancient use was to use the cellulase to kind of smooth out woven fabrics. Well, it's still used today in something we call uh, biopolishing. And again, it's that cellulase activity that breaks down those um, larger plant, uh, materials and, and other uh, polysaccharides. And so you can look at the fabric here. So here's uh, the fabric in a very uh, scanning uh, micrograph of it. And you can see all of these other pieces, and you can see the little kind of roughness there. After it's treated um, with the cellulase, you can see it's really very nice and, and clear, and you don't see all of those little pieces in there. And again, that cellulase is extracted from um, different strains of fungi. And so along with that enzyme, there's a lot of other enzymes that are used, in, especially in processed foods. Um, so enzymes from fungi are used there. You guys have all heard of or seen or worn stonewashed jeans, right? And so stonewashed jeans were made by getting the pumice stones and basically making them that, that really worn look. 
Um, well, pumice stones are sometimes hard to come by, and they can really sometimes damage um, clothes. And so they use, um, again, some of the uh, cellulases from fungi to give that effect of the uh, stonewashed jeans. So now your stonewashed jeans are actually fungi washed jeans. Mm -hmm. um, so pectinases um, are also an enzyme that fungi produce. So pectinases break down um, pectin, which is you'd find in the cell wall of plants, particularly of fruits. Um, using a pectinase to extract juices um, from fruits can increase yield uh, from 30 to 75 percent. So using the pectases, pectinases really um, can, can do that. Also using uh, pectinases for the production of um, fructose syrups. So you can see just these together. It's a billion dollar industry, right? And that is, is a responsible, uh, that a fungi is responsible for. Um, I'm just going to throw this list here. Sorry, it's a crazy list. But these are just some of the enzymes um, that are extracted or that enzyme, that fungi produce that are extracted. Um, and then here are some of the main source. It's all um, different fungi. So you might recognize um, some of these, particularly here, you know, being in Porter Hall in biology and chemistry. It's like, oh yeah, we probably use proteases, amylases, right? Um, medicines also, and so here's the um, insulin. And so I already talked a little bit about how um, some um, companies are using fungi to produce insulin. Um, that's by using, you know, by bioengineering them, putting in a, a gene for the human uh, enzyme, for, or sorry, human um, hormone insul uh, insulin, and then it being produced directly into to the bats and then e extracted. And then here's a couple of others, cyclosporine and statins. Anybody know what cyclosporine or the cyclosporins are for? What's that? Um, so we're antibiotics. A lot of these, this one in particular is used for um, preventing the re rejection of organs. Right? And that's because this has a, a compound in it, or, or the, the compound itself, which is extracted um, from fungi that the fungi produce, will inhibit um, the enzyme kind of the, is along the cascade that activates your inflammatory uh, process, so the cytokines that are involved in the inflammatory process. So it inhibits that, and so this is something that would be used to prevent rejection of organs. Um, yeah. Statins. Statins are for uh, lowering cholesterol. And so um, this one inhibits an enzyme that converts um, lipids to um, cholesterol in the liver. Right. And these are all, uh, so these two products, particularly isolated uh, directly from fungi. Okay. Chitin, so fungi have chitin, but another thing that has chitin are a lot of uh, insects and crustaceans. Their uh, body walls are full of this chitin. And so chitin, you might not know it, it's in like a lot of your beauty products. Right? And so it is um, been treated with a, uh, a strong base to produce something called, um, I, I always want to call it chitinase, but it's not, uh, ki uh, chitose. And so what this does, um, it does lots of different things. So one of it, it's a stabilizer um, in the skin. Oh, sorry, there it is, chitos chitosan. Get that chitosan, and so it's uh, made from treating chitin and becomes this chitosan. Chitosan has a huge potential, um, and it's it's already being used in things like your beauty products to help with um, moisturizing. So it helps the body um, take up some of that um, moisturizer. So it's, it has hydrating um, effects. It's also in um, things like hairsprays um, to prevent things from being just too stiff. So that hairspray will make it a little bit more um, flexible. Um, it's also used in ice cream um, as a kind of a stabilizing um, agent. And so um, there's a lot of things with uh, chitosan. 
but that chitosan has been used uh, um, from the chitin that comes from uh, either uh, crustaceans rather than fungi. But fungi have got a lot of chitin um, in it. And so if you look at this cartoon cross-section of a cell wall, you have kind of a big part of it that's got um, chitin. And so uh, people are starting to use, kind of moving away from using crustaceans to, as the source of chitin to using the chitin from um, fungi. Right. So that's going uh, to bring me to the um, uh, uh, future of fungi. And so um, as I talked about using um, the, the chitin from fungi to produce this um, chitosan, um, uh, one of the things that it can be used for is in agriculture. So it has antifungal uh, and antibacterial properties. And so they find that when they treat seeds with this, they also actually um, germinate quicker and it activates their own um, sort of defense mechanisms. And so they are um, kind of more hardy. So here's a figure, this is from this isn't really an agricultural, even though I have it here. This is an orchid seed, and this is uh, treated kind of without chitosan, and this is with chitosan. Um, and so it, it, you get more um, robust uh, plants. You also get, um, you get increased yield. Another thing that they're looking at using chitosan for is as a um, uh, kind of a preservative for fresh fruits to basically make them uh, to extend their shelf life. And so if you look at um, kind of here, sort of before uh, treatment and then at day 10, this is what the um, untreated control looks like for um, tomatoes, oranges, bananas, and strawberries. Nothing really works well for the strawberries, but <laughs> you can see um, that it really helps with the tomatoes when you add some of the chitosan, um, also with the uh, oranges. A little bit with the uh, bananas, but again, not for the fungi. Right? Um, and so there's um, potential for use in kind of extending shelf life um, with, with the kind of sand. There's also uh, potential for um, the, uh, the seeds themselves, treating the seeds um, to, to make them uh, germinate better, to activate their own defenses. So then maybe you wouldn't have to use as much uh, pesticides because they would be, uh, their natural defenses would uh, kick in a little bit more. So that's something that uh, people are looking at that, that might be used, used much more. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about chitosan. Uh, one of the things that uh, is a little bit more controversial is that it's a pretty good absorbent and it's also an absorbent for lipids. And so some people have been uh, touting it as a dieting, a really great dieting thing. Uh, so if you take this, um, the chitosan, um, it'll kind of take up the, all, all, all of that fat. Um, you really don't feel as um, hungry and then you uh, lose weight or it takes it. But there's a lot of, there's some studies have shown that that doesn't work at all and it's probably not safe. <laughs> okay. um, it's also being used for, or looked at for use with water filtration, uh, this, this um, chitosan. And so um, when using uh, just kind of the sand uh, filtration, kind of get, get, get things settled down, um, you get about, I think, 50% of the turbidity um, gets kind of taken up. But when you combine the chitosan with sand, it basically can purify up about 99%. So it's really very high. It's also used for um, clarifying or, or fining um, wines. Um, and so that getting settling out all of the kind of the extra stuff in the wines that key to sand can uh, basically clarify that as well. Mm -hmm. um, biomedicine. And so this, this is really kind of interesting. One of the things that they're looking at, again, this is key to sand. Um, building these hydrogels or these hydropacks as a drug delivery system or a, for gene therapy. And so the idea, again, because these guys are really um, uh, help with kind of moisturizing and, and, and taking things up, that they make these little gel packs, these are kind of what they look like. 
and um, in bed, so kind of make this matrix and embed uh, the drug um, in it. And I guess there's different ways to do this. And then you can put it um, on the skin and then it basically the, gets taken up into the body at a very, um, not a very fast, but it's kind of a more of a slow release. And so it's um, been, been suggested that that's a better way to get the medicines in really much more slowly. And because these are, uh, they're non-toxic, they're biodegradable, they basically then just pretty much disappear and then you get the, the, the drug in there. And then also um, putting in particular genes for gene therapy and then administering that way. That I didn't really uh, read a lot about that, so that's all I can say about it. Um, <clears throat> another thing is just wound healing. So they found that the chitosan also has got um, a coagulative properties. Um, they help the cells sort of mobilize and um, come together, and so it helps uh, prevent bleeding or, de or, or slow the rate of bleeds, uh, but it also increases the rate of wound healing. So as you, so the idea is to make these bandages um, that are made with this chitosan, put on the wound, and that really accelerates the healing process because it has this property that allows the cells to come together more quickly. Um, so here's just another picture of a, of a bandage um, for this this wound healing. Okay, so some of the things uh, we can kind of switch away, uh, move away from uh, talking about the effects of uh, fungi on humans, and we can look at bigger impacts with the environment. And so there are particular processes that put a lot of um, chemicals, um, harmful chemicals into the environment that might be replaced with a more natural process by using some of the enzymes in fungi. And one of the examples is um, pulping. So at paper mills, um, there's some chemicals that are used in that process that can in, uh, damage the environment. There is a particular fungus called white rot. You might be familiar with that. So white rot can pretty much liquefy um, uh, wood. And so by harnessing some of the enzymes from the uh, white rot, people are starting to, and, and there's limited mills that are using this for um, the pulping of, of that. But instead of using these harmful chemicals, they're using the um, enzymes um, from fungi to do this. And so here's an example of and the wood chips with a pulp on them, and then here's, um, basically this is white rot. So one of the things that, that prompted me to want to do this talk is looking at the stuff that some fungi can do, the stuff some fungi can break down. So um, it can break down, there's some fungi that can break down jet fuel. Right? Um, it can break down really very um, toxic uh, materials. And so if there's fungi that can, some of them can break down plastic, right, which is, is, is pretty amazing. And so one way is to use uh, bioremediation, or the term when you use fungi is mycoremediation. And so the idea is to have areas where you have this, this growing this, these fungi that have this ability to break down these really very toxic chemicals. Um, so you have this source of contamination, you have it, uh, breaking it down basically into food, decontaminating it, so now uh, that is no longer a toxic substance, and then um, basically reclaiming and, and cleaning up that, that land. Um, here's a picture of one that, uh, this was a site of an oil spill, and so here are, uh, it was, was planted with this uh, uh, fungi, and then after um, a few years, basically reclaim that, and you're starting to get these other shrubs um, growing. Right. Um, another thing that was really interesting is uh, bioprinting. And so using some, again, the, the chitinase, sorry, the, I keep calling it that, the chitosan, um, as well as other components of the fungi for um, using like basically 3D printing, but using the, the chemicals or the, the compounds of the fungus to make these biodegradable kind of like plastics. And you can add the natural colors um, to them as well. And so you can get these different uh, products that then they are, they will, they're hardy, but then they will um, uh, biodegrade. 
Also, um, some fungi have been growing, so the mycelium kind of growing into these molds to produce packaging containers, and that's one thing that, that um, has been, uh, been used. Another one I, I found, except they used it more with the uh, chitin in insects, is something called shilk. And so they took this um, compound and made um, kind of like a silk-like protein that was really very strong, but made it into like a more of a plastic looking thing that was as strong as aluminum. And so that might be some kind of the future of some of these products that might be more biodegradable. Um, so, came across this. This is a mycotorium. Um, this is some kind of future um, of fungi. And so, this is um, kind of the dome where you'd be growing the fungus. And here is the culture of the fungus in here. These little egg shaped things are um, an agar substance, kind of like a, a flavored agar substance. And then down here is just plastic. And so this plastic is uh, irradiated using EUV light. And then these little um, egg-shaped agar things are filled with these, this plastic. And then you add a little bit of this, um, called this fung fungus into it. And then you let it basically eat the plastic. And so after it eats the plastic and makes it pretty harmless, you can then eat this fungus agar mix. So um, I think this might be a future. So here's this fancy one that you might be able to eat. Um, so I've got a little video of this. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> unsurprisingly, it, it, they say it tastes like a mushroom, <laughs> but uh, they're working on different flavors, like mango flavors and uh, kind of almost anything <laughs> you can think of. Right? Uh, I thought that was neat. Uh, so another one, this is the one I came across just this last year, and this was um, other products that you can make with, with fungi. And this is... Um, a company called Mycoworks. I nearly broke my arm, and the mushroom still is doing fine. <laughs> So that's a, that's a fungus. That's that's mushrooms mycelium. are one of the greatest transformers of material on the planet. They're the primary recyclers. Mushrooms are breaking down dead organic matter, entering it into a mineral again. They are just this tiny little part of this huge organism that is called mycelium that lives underground. And the fact that they might be used for batteries or spaceships is something that I never would have thought of originally. They're probably from another planet. Right at the beginning, I was like, this can be an art material. And so I wanted to create the furniture out of it. Then became, I'll make a building out of this. Then it was like, I'll make a company out of this. What we're doing here is we're trying to figure out how we can get the mycelium to grow into new types of geometries so that the mycelium is going to grow stronger. You tell someone we grow mycelium and they're like, what? 
What is that? Bill and his team are at the front lines of advancing our capacities for manufacturing with biology, having the mushrooms make metals and glasses. It's not a fantasy because they just know that it's true. And so it's more like, how do you convince the world that it belongs with us? The proof is in the pudding. One of the tests that we do with the fungi is we subject it to some pretty hot flames. This color is actually so good that you can continue to eat it. The fungus material is self-extinguishing. This is a very desirable quality. When we're trying to figure out the material qualities, we would put it under compression. So that's the kind of failure that you want in your house. Compared to something like cement, I think it exploded a little bit. It can localize a vibration and not create a catastrophic failure. You can create all these pockets in it so it allows it to float. That brick did not even try. The possibilities for what you might use my simile for are scarily endless. Batteries, airplanes, trains, cars, shoes, bed, bulletproof vests, kids, toys, certainly houses, helmets, insulation, anything that's made out of wood now, your boat, making rocket ships, throw robots out of them that would be partially alive and biodegradable. You could say that the idea that you'd ever grow a cell phone from your garden clippings out of wood fungus is 200 years away. But technology has come true when people make them true. You saw something that has always been in our world, but nobody saw it before. This day definitely you feel like this is not going nowhere. And some days it feels like it's amazing, everybody's supporting me. It's gonna go somewhere. Okay, baby, go to work there. Everything that we produce now that we call agricultural waste is actually an incredible resource that mushrooms can grow on. We're past peak oil, so if we're gonna replace our current materials with something, it's still gonna have to hold up in some type of sustainable way. I think about this quite seriously now in terms of what these materials might do to show that we live in a world of plenty. So your cell phone in the future might be made out of fungi, right? Um, one of the other th things that, um, that they had is that they're starting to make a product that basically get the right um, color and it looks just like leather, right? So, all right, with that, um, I'll take any questions. <laughs> if I can the answer now. I'll turn on the light over here. That's a good question. I didn't come across anything where they, they've tried that, but I mean, if it has a similar, but the, the problem is, um, not sure how, how well, how long it would last in, in the water, if it's kind of this powdery stuff, but that's a good question. Yeah. It's not toxic, so it wouldn't really you know, well, harm anything. Right. I don't know, that's a good question. Maybe something to try. So, uh, I've heard that one of the first uses of fermented beverages was to purify contaminated water. So, when mm -hmm. people are brewing beer and wine, are the yeast purifying that at some level? Um, that's a good question. I, probably to some extent, but, but, but all the thing I, re I read that it was initially pretty much accidental with, with a lot of kind of a atmospheric yeast. But I'm not sure about... Um, if that was kind of one of the main purposes. Maybe it, maybe it started, but there's so much other better things. Well, <laughs> yeah, about no, <laughs> aspects of it, yeah, right. Yeah, the, the antibiotic properties, yeah. you could argue that it may have worked. I just didn't know. That's, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't come across anything about that. That's a good, good question, yeah. Yeah? Well, I'm also really curious about how all these things evolved in these fungi. Like, what are the roles of, you know, in, in, in their world? Why do these enzymes, why do they evolve all these enzymes? Um, so, when I think about, I think when a lot of them evolved um, was really about the, the kind of the radiation also of, of insects and then kind of their, their habit. So, I think that a lot of it evolved for competition, um, for similar things, 
so the antibiotic properties, for example, to um, competing with bacteria for certain for, uh, uh, resources, right? Um, for uh, focusing on new foods like um, so like a parasite on a on an insect, yeah. So the the fact that kind of the time at which it evolved was also the radiation of other organisms. I think that's why it, it evolved. Right. Yeah. Yes. So I think you have some mushrooms out there growing on a bioreclamation site. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> they say probably not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably not, not want to eat those. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Um, I think it depends on, on the type that you use because some of them can basically break it down so much so that there's no toxic anywhere, but toxins, but I probably wouldn't. <laughs> yep. Yes? Oh, you know, yes, but I'm sorry, I don't remember which one it was. I, 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 I can, after, afterwards, I can pull up my notes and we can talk. Yeah, that's a good, good. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, um, I, t for those students in here, I teach mycology next fall. No, a year. Yeah, it's, it's a fall class. So, I just taught it this last fall. So, it would be fall 2000 and what would that be, 18? <laughs> right. There's, there's, it's really a very understudied. It is a very understudied organism. Study yeah, uh, but it's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs>